right, guys, uh, we'll start. So uh, my name is Kurt Pomeroy. I am an IT security specialist uh, with ION United. Um, this is my first ever speaking uh, engagement, so I'm excited, uh, a little nervous, but it should be fun. Um, so the topic of my talk today is about how I transitioned from an IT generalist into cybersecurity professional. So, you know, this, this will just be um, just my talk, you know, my, my personal experience, everybody's going to have a different, um, you know, a different road, I guess. And most of you guys are probably already working in cybersecurity in one facet or another. But uh, this is just my, you know, my experience, what happened to me, how I transitioned, uh, you know, from being the regular IT guy, you know, that wears many different hats uh, to cybersecurity, which is something that I always wanted to do. Anyway, it was always a passion of mine. And so, you know, this is pretty much it. Um, so the uh, the first thing I want to start off with here is, let me see if this transitions up, right? Okay, so I'm a, I'm a Newfoundlander, so I moved to Calgary two years ago. And just some some observations that I that I noticed here when we moved out from Newfoundland is, you know, just to break the ice a little bit. Um, the first thing I noticed actually is just about everybody has a some sort of <laughs> crack or dent or chip in their windshield. And I guess it's just funny to me because we don't really see that back home. But you know, I walk the dogs every day and and I see all these cars and and you know traffic lights and things, and everybody's got a cracked windshield. So the uh, the uh, insurance companies and these these auto body shops must be making a fortune, but uh, I guess it's probably because um, you know you use a lot of sand and, and 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 whatever for for road maintenance, and I guess the salt doesn't work after you know temperatures of minus ten uh, and below. So uh, I just thought it was funny, and you know there's no wind here. There's very little wind. Uh, Newfoundland's very windy all the time, of course. You know, right on the ocean. So uh, that was a nice change. You don't you just don't have this blowing you know crazy wind every day to deal with. Um, you know, and of course the driving, I mean, you know, everybody has their own experiences, but, uh, I find the drivers in Western Canada and Calgary, very, very, you know, courteous, especially downtown. If you're in the wrong lane, and put your indicator on, somebody always lets you in. So it's nice to see, uh, back home, you know, not so much, but, uh, you know, another observation I find drivers here are, are much better, um, on the whole. Uh, this fourth picture here is just a picture from. Uh, Strathmore, so I moved from Calgary to Strathmore last year, it's about 40 minutes away from the city. And uh, just you see all these hay bales and this flat land, so it's just a nice, uh, it's very different, you know, than in Newfoundland and the East Coast, it's very rocky and hilly and you just don't see that flat landscape, so I thought that was kind of nice. Uh, and the last funny observation was, was this snow blower uh, contraption, or leaf blower, I guess, uh, you know, <laughs> back in Newfoundland. Uh, the snow is so heavy and wet and rain drizzle fog all the time. You'd never get away with something like this. But here, you know, you see people downtown with those, those snow blowers, leaf blower devices, and you can just blow the snow away. So I just, I thought that was funny, but you know, just, just some of my observations as uh, a Newfoundlander, you know, living at West, like, you know, so many, uh, Newfoundlanders have done over the years. Um, so next slide. So the, the obligatory, who am I slide, right? Uh, again. Uh, I'm a Newfoundlander, now living in Alberta for the past two years, 40 years old. Uh, two of my doggies over here, I'm sure you can see them. Uh, Roman is on the left and Junior is on the right. Um, and so we don't have any kids or anything. Uh, you know, just a conscious decision, I guess. We just, it just didn't happen for us, my wife and I. But you know, we've got dogs. Uh, Roman over here on the left, he's a rescue dog. So we'll, we're happy with that and we'll continue to to rescue dogs and we have a soft spot in our heart for senior pets. So we'll, we'll probably, uh, you know, the next, the next dog or two we get will be from a shelter and probably uh, a senior pet. It's just something really nice about caring for a, an old senior who's just lazy and, you know, just wants to lay down on the couch every day. So, so that was nice. Um, oh yeah. And one more thing uh, for me, um, I also like, you know, besides of course, IT security, I like, um, you know, strict strategy games. So I like to play chess and I used to play online poker, you know, semi-professionally about 10 years ago, I played online uh, six days a week, uh, you know, eight or 10, 12 hours a day. So that was interesting. But all of these, you know, strategy games and things that helps, I find that you can you can use those skills and you can relate them to, to cybersecurity uh, you know, for pen tests and things like that. So, okay, so just a quick sl slide about, you know, why, why should we get into cybersecurity? Why should we work in cybersecurity? Um, very fun and challenging. Let me just move my laptop a little bit. Uh, you know, you learn new stuff all the time. 
you're exposed to customer environments where they have different technologies, whether it be Microsoft ATP or EDR technologies, Carbon Black or you know Splunk or something like that. So it's really nice to get exposure to different um, environments and different technologies that you probably normally wouldn't uh, have the chance to, to normally work with. Of course, job security, right? I mean, cybersecurity is a hot market. Uh, does It's not going anywhere anytime soon. The Canadian government's investing a lot of money in it. That's kind of like a mechanic and everybody needs a mechanic. So I, I feel like everybody needs some sort of cybersecurity work in some aspect. So it's a really great industry to be in. I mean, most of you guys are, are in it already, so you obviously know. But it's nice to have that job security. And it's nice to know that um, you know, you're know you're in demand, right? If you work in cybersecurity uh, in any aspect and you've got some years of experience under your belt, um, you probably shouldn't have a hard time finding some meaningful and employment. Uh, you know, and another thing too, recruiters, uh, once once you're in cybersecurity, you get your name out there, recruiters will come to you. I mean, I, I typically get um, an email once a week from a recruiter from LinkedIn or from Monster or uh, Indeed asking if I'm interested in this remote opportunity or that opportunity. So it's always nice to have that, you know, in-demand aspect. And it's nice when recruiters come to you for work instead of the other way around. Of course, the salary is good. Uh, and there's some benefits there, you know, depending on who you work for, there could be performance benefits, there could be, um, you know, additional time off, uh, paid training or reimbursement for training, which could be huge depending on the type of training you want to go for. Um, you know, performance bonuses, travel allowance, gas, things like that. So it depends on, depends on who you work for. But overall, you know, another benefit to working in cybersecurity and of course travel and a flexible work environment. I mean, we a lot of people are working from home now, but uh, you know, I, when I started with Ion after a month or two, I transitioned to working from home and, and I absolutely love it. And you don't have to get up and, you know, get into a cold car in the morning and drive into the office. So it's, that's really nice. Um, and, you know, obviously a lot of us now are working from home, so we all get to enjoy that uh, that advantage. Um, and of course, <laughs> report writing is a, is a big part of what we do. So, you know, it's just kind of put in there as tongue in cheek, but, you know, it's just one of those things that if you're gonna work in cybersecurity, and especially if you wanna be a pen tester or something like that, uh, you'll have to, uh, you know, get used to writing lots of reports and, and meeting deadlines. Uh, so a little bit about my background before we get started. I graduated, I'm, all, I'm old now, I'm <laughs> 40 years old. I graduated high school in 97, and then I took a three-year um, computer support specialist program. So that was just a general introduction to IT. You know, we did hardware and software troubleshooting, um, networking, programming, operating systems, Windows NT and, and Windows 98 or 2000, I think at the time. Uh, so that was, you know, that was sort of an introduction to IT, but that's where I really started. Uh, we had a Linux course, which was part of that program. That's what, what really started my interest in cybersecurity was that Linux course. And once I sat down at the, uh, at the console, and I remember, I specifically remember mounting an image, mounting a CD, putting the disc in and typing the mount command and listen to the disc spin up. I thought, oh, this is really cool. And, and around that time, you know, I started to read about uh, Linux security and it was the hackers operating system. So that just, that really piqued my interest. So I really, uh, that's where my, my cybersecurity kind of uh, interest started way back then. But it actually took a long time before I could actually get into the industry. Um, uh, so, you know, and actually part of my, um, my three-year IT program was an eight-week work term. So I was able to convert or pivot that work term into full-time employment uh, for the last uh, seven or eight years. <laughs> yeah, the uh, yeah the disc man right we all had that and the, the anti skip and all that stuff so I, I thought that was kind of funny uh, but you know like I said we're uh, the, the kids don't know the struggle and yes yeah the, the cable was definitely short you know, sometimes for sure um, so I'll just talk about sort of the early years and the medium years and then there's a transitional period there so for me my early years in IT uh, I was in an IT admin at, at two private uh, K to twelve schools. So that was my first real job, and that was actually where my work term uh, was at the St. Bonaventure's College there um, during my IT program. So I made some good contacts there, and they liked the work I did. So they hired me part-time. I worked part-time at St. Bonds, and the other half of the day was at Lakecrest Schools in, in St. John's, Newfoundland. So that's where I had my first real job, my first real um, exposure to IT. I mean, I wore many hats. You know, you, you connect up AV equipment, uh, printers, you know, computers, uh, anything that had a... Uh, you know, cell phones, wireless devices, anything that had a cable or a power cord, you know, they expected you to know how to do it because I was the only IT person there. Um, you know, these, these private schools, they're, they're not government funded, so there wasn't a whole lot of money for salary and for hiring 
you know, full full staff of IT support people. Uh, but that was good because that actually got me into the into IT. You know, I was working with different hardware and software every day, working with people, kids, um, old and young, you know, parents, uh, teachers. So I made a lot of good contacts there, and that really helped me uh, develop the personal aspect because you you know you need to you deal with people at the end of the day, right? So you have to learn how to talk to people on different technical levels, and you have to you know deal with kids and teenagers and parents and teachers. So that was really really um, really got me started. You know, I had a good foundation. And um, also, I just wanted to mention, I did do a little bit of work in Alberta in 2012. I worked on the uh, the Curl Oil Sands project just as a contractor. Uh, I just did a couple of rotations of, of fly in, fly out, but it just wasn't for me. Um, I think it was 13 and 7, 13 days on, 7 off. But one day is gone for travel to, and one day is gone to travel from. And that's a long flight from Edmonton to, uh, to St. John's. Uh, you know, once every couple of weeks. So, um, you know, I didn't really like it. The work was the work was fun, but just the travel, I, I really didn't enjoy. So I had, I did have a little stint in Alberta uh, years ago. Um, so we have, so that was the first, you know, five or 10 years, just getting that experience. And I'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. Uh, so then I had a, a middle years, I guess you could call them, 2012 to 2016. I was an IT data manager at an oil and gas company um, and they had a lot of custom developed software. They did a lot of 3D and seismic imaging of uh, UXOs or unexploded ordnance and pipelines below the seabed. So that was really cool for me because it was a heavy, heavy Linux aspect. And they have all these high powered systems and GPUs and rendering. And there was a lot of intellectual property that needed to be uh, protected and archived and stored. So I got to sort of use some of that Linux security experience while I worked at this small oil and gas company. And there was an, there was an office in Aberdeen. So I had to kind of work with, um, you know, Active Directory in, in both uh, locations. Uh, but it was really cool because I, I had a good chance to flex some of that Linux security muscle. And again, that just, that just um, in, in, I guess, in, increased my desire to, to learn more. You know, I wanted to make sure the systems were secure. The IP was secure, of course, if that information had gotten out, you know, uh, you know, it could have been detrimental for the company. And one just funny thing, I guess, about my time at this small oil and gas company is anybody who knows me knows that I love the sun in the summer, but I hate the water. Anything over my neck, you know, I freak out. So my boss asked me one day if I wanted to go to Aberdeen for this uh, offshore training. And I only went because I had never been to Aberdeen before. Um, so it was a beautiful place, and then the reality set in that I actually had to take this underwater survival training. And, um, you know, it was really, really nerve-wracking for me, very stressful, anxiety levels through the roof. Uh, one of the, one of, this is a three-day course, and one part of the course, whoops, sorry, they actually put you in a simulated cockpit, like this picture here, and they, um, they, they dunk you underwater, they flip you upside down, and then you have to swim out through the window and pop up to the surface. And so you had to do that, I think five or seven times. And the red helmet here indicates somebody who's not strong in the water. And I think the blue helmets were, you know, if you were comfortable in the water. So of course I had a red helmet. Um, but, um, you know, I, I was really, really worried. And I remember in the, in the hotel room in the morning, I, I got in the bathtub and I put my head underwater and plugged my nose, and <laughs> just tried to get used to that, uh, that feeling and you know water in your ears and, and just uh, you know, it's very very uncomfortable for me. But anyway, I ended up doing it. So you know it's one of those things where um, you're glad you did it. And I'm still surprised to this day actually that I was able to to do that because I'd never do that again. Never ever. <laughs> Sorry, never ever again. It's just something that's not for me. Uh, but I did it and I'm proud of that. So that 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 will come back later in the presentation where I talk about you know taking a chance and doing something outside your comfort zone because that was really big for me. Um, you know, in my whole transition from IT to cybersecurity, as you can imagine, you know, transitioning from one role to another, not really having any real world experience can be very stressful and, you know, it can impact your confidence. And, and so doing something like that, stepping outside your comfort zone, and doing something that you don't like, uh, and then, you know, achieving your goal or whatever is, is just really rewarding. So <laughs> I thought I thought it was interesting, but uh, you know I'll never do it again. <laughs> never. And it's funny because when they flip you over and you come up, they put you right back in. The divers they grab you and they put you right back in, and then you go up, you come down, you flip over. So you know you have no time to say no. It's literally 
five or ten seconds after you pop up, they, they grab me by the by the, the vest or suit or whatever you're wearing, they put you in and flip you upside down again. So I didn't even have time to say no. But the good thing is it was over before you know it. It was probably five or ten minutes. And that was it. So, you know, just a just a fun little tidbit there about uh, you know, <laughs> never ever again will I will I want to do that and I hope I never do. Um, and of course, Newfoundland is big for oil and gas, right? So, uh, so here we go. So Crossroads. So 2018, um, I was a contractor for Exxon Mobil, and I was supporting this Hebron offshore oil platform. You know, it's this huge 14 billion dollar project. Um, you know, they sit it out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It just it'll drill for oil for the next 50 years or however long the reserves lasted there. Um, but I was, you know, it was my first contractor role, and uh, I didn't like being a contractor. I kind of felt like I was, um, you know, just I could be disposed of at any time. You didn't have that job security. Uh, anytime there was a snow holiday or a storm or you were sick, you didn't get paid for it. So there was a lot of uh, a lot of things about being a contractor I didn't really like. I was always an employee, a salaried employee. Uh, so and my, you know, my my contract was expiring. Um, and to be honest, after 18 years in IT, I was bored. I was I had no interest in it anymore. I didn't keep up on the latest. CPUs or RAM or, or new boards or any of that stuff. I just, I was, I was, I felt like I was at the end of my career in IT. 18 years is a long time. And I just kind of felt like, you know, I got to do something else uh, in IT or just quit it altogether. And I always had the desire, you know, going back to those Linux days, right, of, of, of um, you know, working with Linux and security. Uh, I actually went to a SANS conference in 2003, a long time ago, Fire Forensics investigation response and e-crime. Um, and that really, really had me hooked. I got to meet like Stephen Northcutt and a couple other SANS guys. And that, that cemented, you know, my desire to work in IT, but it just didn't work out. The, the, the roles I were in were always gen, generic, general IT support, like, you know, reset a password, fix a printer, install some software, you know, that kind of thing. So I was ready to make a change and, you know, I had to think long and hard about it, but uh, I decided that I really wanted to go for, you know, a cybersecurity role. And, like I said, for the reasons mentioned earlier, it's very in demand, good pay, you know, uh, lots of lots of benefits. So I went for it. Uh, next slide, actually, this this picture is of the Hebron platform. Of course, this is a giant. Doesn't really give you the the scope, but uh, this is a massive, massive uh, piece of equipment. A lot of these different modules were created in like, Korea, and they they um, ship them over to Newfoundland, and they they put them together. So really, really cool to be part of something like that. So I was really proud of of the two years that I spent working with uh, Exxon and helping, I was doing the IT support for the project. So uh, that was a really, really cool accomplish, accomplishment for me. I think I've got a couple pictures here on the next slide. Um, that's me there all bundled up. Uh, you know, as you're so high up, this was, this was January, it's really, really cold and windy at the top of this, this thing. It's probably uh, up here somewhere, I don't know if you can see, uh, at the top of the, the structure. I don't know who this guy is, so I took his, I just blocked this picture out. Uh, but you can kind of, kind of give you a scale. This is sort of a tugboat here. Um, so just a really, really massive structure. I think the, the power requirements could, I think it could power something like 30,000 homes uh, in St. John's. Um, so just a, just a massive project. Um, and actually there was no elevators. So every day when I was walking around this rig deploying IT equipment, um, I had to walk everywhere. So I think I averaged 15,000 steps a day for five days a week. So as you can imagine, when I got home, I was completely wiped out. <laughs> and there were long days. There were 12 hour days, five days a week. So, but it was really good exercise and I, I really, really enjoyed it. And um, of all the IT equipment that I deployed, nothing went, went missing. And these type of projects are known for uh, things either getting thrown overboard or just missing or stolen. So I was really proud of that also. And I was able to keep really good track of all the equipment deployed and, and all that. So it was, it was kind of cool. Uh, I've got another picture here. This is the actual, um, the tow out. So when everything is completed, they, they towed it out from the harbor and they, they dragged, I think there was about eight or nine tugboats and they pull it out to the Atlantic Ocean. And that's where, you know, that's where it's gonna sit for the next 50 years or whatever. Uh, so just, just a figure, there's a cool picture I, I throw in there. Um, you can kind of get a sense of the scale just, just from the little tugboats there. And they actually they're, they weren't small either, so. Uh, okay, so from for now, um, we're going to do sort of a step-by-step -step, uh, plan or step-by-step -step how I transitioned from IT to cybersecurity. Uh, the other stuff was just kind of a recap and a little bit, little bit about my history. 
uh, how I got started and some of the things that kind of guided me towards cybersecurity. Uh, so of course, the very first thing you got to do if you want to transition, you want to get into cybersecurity, you've got to make a plan. That's what I did. Um, you know, six months before my contract was up, I um, said to the wife, you know, this is what I want to do. I put a plan in motion. I wrote it down, put it up on the board. Um, you know, and there's an old chess saying that says, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And that's, that's exactly right. If you don't set a plan and set these goals, it, it'll just be more difficult, I think, to, to, to go where you want to go and, and to get to that next level or to break into cybersecurity or whatever, whatever it is that your, your goal would be. Um, but, you know, life is short, right? Um, I'm 40 years old now. I, I was ready for a change. I was prepared to move anywhere. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. I mean, I, I was ready to go to the U.S., Spain, UK, wherever the, the cybersecurity job was, um, I was ready to move. Um, so, you know, and that's what I said to the wife, uh, be prepared to move. Um, so, of course, step number two was you've got to figure out, if you want to transition into IT, you've got to figure out what you like, what you want to do. I mean, there's there's all kinds of different you know, subcategories out there to choose from. There's, of course, penetration testing, ethical hacking, which is very in right now. Um, but there's plenty of other options out there. Maybe you like incident response. That can be a very, very lucrative um, area road to go down. Uh, forensics, I mean, you could end up doing working for um, law enforcement, uh, government agencies. Um, you know, there's no shortage in compromises and breaches, as we all know every day. So, you know, forensics is huge. And, um, you know, you could be the firewall guru. You could be the database guy, you know. Um, you could do web application pen testing. You could just focus on web apps. I mean, everybody's got a web application these days, so that's another area where there's huge demand and a big shortage, I think. You could work in a security operations center as an analyst, and that actually might be a, a good introduction if you want to get into more more defined cybersecurity role is you could work as a SOC analyst because then you get exposure to, you know, the day-to-day, -day, right? All the noise and all the, the um, alerting systems and, and seams and, and uh, just different incident levels and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's probably a good area if someone was interested in moving in from IT to cybersecurity. Uh, SOC analyst might be a good way to go. Uh, but for me, I always had that Linux security background and I, I consider myself a bit of a Linux guru. I've been using it for you know 15 years or more uh, with a strong focus on security. So I knew for me, it was a perfect fit uh, to move in you know from IT to penetration testing. And ethical hacking. So that's that's what I did. That was my plan. Um, so <laughs> the next step is, you know, these these certifications um, they can be expensive, especially some of the the more popular and the more well respected ones. Uh, so you know, I started to save my money. Uh, I cut back on expenses and I did I reviewed finances and found ways to save money. Um, you know, fifty dollars or twenty five dollars a week here or there. If you're able to save twenty bucks a week or twenty five dollars a week, I mean, that's a hundred dollars a month. And in a year's time, that's twelve hundred dollars. That's uh, that's Security Plus, or that's uh, CEH, the Certified Ethical Hacker Certification. So, you know, I, I get it, especially in this economy. Uh, you know, um, money is tight, right? Um, but if you can find a way to save, uh, you know, it, it's an investment in your future, which is the main thing. And for me, particularly, um, the investment that I put in, I mean, it. it it came back around right away because it actually got me an interview, got me a job. And so, I mean, it, was, it paid for itself, you know, 20 folds right away. Once you land a position, you know, you've already, you've already paid for your certification. So, you know, there's lots of ways to save money. There's little money saving apps, right? I mean, cut out the McDonald's and Tim Hortons, uh, you know, save five or 10 bucks, you know, 20 bucks a week or something. And before you know it, you've got 800 or a thousand dollars. And, and of course there's other options if you want to go for something more expensive, uh, you know, you could get a small loan from the bank, get a loan from your parents, credit cards, you know, you name it, however however you want. And you don't have to get a certification. It's just, for me and my story, um, that's what helped because I, I applied for positions with, you know, in my resume that said I had this experience and that experience, but it was mostly self-taught and I never had that, um, I never had that piece of paper. So if you get the piece of paper, of course, doors are going to open up, um, you know, a lot for and then that, that's what happened to me um, let's see so of course okay so you, you figure out what you want to do you, you pick your discipline whether it be incident response forensics pen testing whatever uh, you start saving your pennies right uh, so once you've saved up enough money you know you, you've got to study uh, and that's a big that's a big one and people can say all the time you know I don't have the time um, 
you make the time, right? For me, like we don't have kids, as I mentioned, so it was easier for me to find the time to study in the evenings, um, you know, walk the dogs every day. So I had the, the audio course. So uh, every day I'd walk the dogs, I'd listen to an hour or so of whatever, whatever days, um, courses, you know, for that day. Uh, that really helped kind of sink in um, the training material and, and as opposed to just reading a book and making notes. Of course, you know, I, I used to listen to the presentations in my sleep, um, you know, so subconsciously that might have helped me retain some of the material. Uh, at work, on my lunch breaks, I, I take one of my books and a highlighter and I go into the cafeteria and I take notes and study. So wherever wherever I could, um, you know, you, just, you have to find the time. If you have to get up at six o'clock in the morning and study for an hour before you get ready for work, then, you know, if you really want it, that's what you'll do. So, you know, like anything, if, if, you, if you really, really want it, you know, put in the effort, you know, you'll find the time, you know, if you find three hours to watch TV in the evening, well, then there's time to put a, you know, an hour of study a day um, for, for a, you know, a certification. So for me, I think it was over a couple of months, I, I set a goal to, um, you know, have, have a book completed in two weeks or a, a couple of weeks. So I think for the Sands Pen Testing course, there was five or six books. So, you know, that was a, a couple of months of study. Um, but of course, you know, it, it pays off because you're, you're confident, you're, you're ready, you know, you've, you, you feel like you've, you've done your study, you've done your preparation. Uh, so of course, you know, I'll use SANS as an example because I, you know, I took the SANS course, the, the pen testing course. Um, you can create an index and you can Google for that. So basically an index would be if you had, you know, the book number and then the term and then a description. And the reason why you create an index is, is the SANS, um, courses or certifications exams are open book. So instead of bringing in, you know, a pack of six books, you can have all the information condensed into an index and actually creating the index is a good way to study because you're looking up information, you're putting it in a spreadsheet. So what I did was I put everything in a spreadsheet and then I went to a, a copy shop and had it bound and laminated. And then I had little sticky tabs to, to, to tell me which book was which. So that really, really helped um, because you don't have time the SANS pen testing exam is 125 questions and I think you have a couple hours. So you, d you do not have time to look up every answer. And honestly, when I was doing the exam, uh, I would say eight out of 10 questions, I knew the answer as I was reading the question, but there was a couple where, you know, I used my index just to make sure. Um, but uh, creating the index is very helpful for, for lots of reasons. And SANS actually comes with two practice exams. So what they recommend is you do your study, create your index, um, do your first, take your first practice exam and they will rate you on the different areas and you'll see where you're strong and where you're weak. Uh, go back and restudy in those weak areas and then take the second practice exam. And if you score 80 or better, then uh, you're ready. So then that's what I did. I took a practice exam, I scored 88%, uh, oddly enough. And that's the same score I, I got on the, uh, on the final exam, which was kind of weird. Uh, but once I was over 80%, I took my first practice exam then I booked my real exam right away. And um, I actually, uh, you can donate or gift a practice exam to somebody else. So uh, that's what I did. I didn't need the second one. So I just I gave it to somebody else who was studying for the same, uh, same exam. Um, so of course, <laughs> once you study, then of course you got to write your exam. You know, as I mentioned, I took the SANS 560 pen testing course uh, for lots of reasons. I was a big SANS fan anyway. Uh, you know, I, I know that they're very well respected in the industry. Um, having that certification carries a lot of weight. Uh, with recruiters and with uh, potential employers. So I noticed uh, when you see various job applications, you know, the, all of these um, certifications are preferred or, or um, you know, recommended. It was always SANS or the OSCP or um, Certified Ethical Hacker, something like that. So, um, you know, having the certification, of course, or, I mean, writing the exam and passing, um, it'll certainly open up a lot of doors for you. And of course it's in high demand, right? Cybersecurity is huge, it's not going anywhere. Uh, and there's other options. You don't have to do the SANS one. There's the CEH. Uh, I'm not brave enough for the OSCP, maybe someday. Uh, but Security Plus, and I believe Security Plus is not that expensive, but that would give you a good, um, a good framework for moving forward and, and having that certification on your resume uh, versus someone who, who didn't have it, that would be the deciding factor whether you get the job, I would imagine, you know, over somebody else. So just a couple of, you know, observations there about writing the exam. Um, and yeah, so I mentioned I got 88 in the exam, which was the same score as the practice uh, test, oddly enough. Um, so, you know, you study, 
you, uh, you write your exam, you pass, that's great. You know, now what do you do? So now you have to, uh, you got to get your name out there, right? You've got to, you've got to update that resume, of course. Um, you know, look at it once a year. Uh, I put the little fancy little SANS logo on there just because of the G-Pen logo because I was proud of it. It's first ever certification, real certification that, that I guess I, I never studied for and obtained. Um, so I, you know, for your resume, I always had trouble writing what I thought was a good resume. So I paid somebody to write one for me. <laughs> so it's not really lazy, but I think that in my unique situation where I was trying to transition from IT to cybersecurity and I was sort of in that middle area, um, I needed someone to, who could articulate that uh, better than I could. So top resume was something that I think I found on Monster. And they, they put me with a, um, a resume writer and we had a couple of chats and I gave them my background and my information. And they actually came up with a solid resume for me, uh, which we tweaked a little bit, but it was a really, really good experience. Uh, I would recommend it. I mean, there's so many, there's all kinds of things out there online how to write a good resume. But for me, it was just one thing I, I didn't really have the time or want to put the effort in to, to writing. And I, I was always struggled with writing a good resume. So, you know, just putting it out there, that is an option. Uh, you know, you could probably get someone to look it over for free or whatever, but that's just what I did. Um, you know, professionals, professional resume writers know what to look for and know what employers are looking for. So that's fine. And it's just another investment. So again, you know, save a few dollars here and there. Um, and, you know, obviously you certainly don't have to, but just something that I just felt comfortable handing off to somebody else. So, and it worked because it got me an interview and eventually landed the job. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, so, you, you know, you, you've passed your exam, you updated your resume. The most important factor now is you, you have to start networking. You've got to get your name out there. You have to, you know, upload your resume to Monster and LinkedIn and, and Indeed and all these different uh, resume sites um, because employers are on there all the time and especially for LinkedIn. You know, like I said, I get emails from recruiters once a week, you know, from, from LinkedIn and just from a couple from Monster and a few from other places you know, asking if I'm interested in this position or that position. Uh, so definitely, definitely start networking, um, join different LinkedIn groups, you know, comment and like other people's posts and just, just start getting your name out there, interacting with other people. Uh, there's a couple of settings actually in LinkedIn to let employers know that you're open to opportunities. So I just wanted to highlight those here in case people weren't aware. Uh, you can go in and set these options uh, to let recruiters know that you are interested in and open for opportunities and you can pick if you're looking for full-time work or part-time work or whatever, if you're, if you're willing to relocate the areas you're willing to relocate to. Um, and of course, all of these sites have some sort of, you know, manager resume type feature. And a lot of them now LinkedIn included has a, you know, an easy apply, a quick apply button. So if you see a, a job advertisement that looks good for you, you know, a lot of times, especially for LinkedIn and, and Indeed, you can click the easy apply button and, and it uploads your current resume and has all your contact information. So. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to apply. Apply for all kinds of jobs if, if you if you can do it. I mean, a lot of people have kids and families and things. They may not be able to, to do what I did and move, you know, across the country uh, for work. But, uh, you know, start networking, get your name out there. Um, you know, just, just take advantage of all these features. And especially the, you know, the I applied for probably, uh, I don't know, 50 or 100 jobs in the month or two after I had my SANS certification. And, uh, you know, a lot of them I didn't hear back, but some, some I did. So of course, you know, you might be lucky if you get one of the 10, you know, interviews, but um, definitely just get out there, start networking, get your name out there and apply, apply for everything. I mean, that's what I did because I, I was prepared to move. I didn't, you know, I, didn't, I had no idea where I would end up, but I'm you know, really glad I've ended up in Alberta. But, um, you know, I, I really could have ended up anywhere, but you know, not everybody has that luxury. Uh, and for me, um, Funny story, I, I had an interview in Ontario with a, with a security company and the interview was went great and it was a practical exam and that went really well. And, uh, and then the, uh, Ontario has a breed specific legislation which does not allow pit bull and a pit bull type breeds into their province. So I was pretty disappointed because it was looking really well and I was excited. It would have been my first ever, you know, cybersecurity job and we're ready to move to Ontario. And, Enjoy the much you know better weather and, and warm summers, but uh, unfortunately it didn't work out because of the, the BSL. But you know everything happens for a reason, and the ion opportunity popped up uh, shortly thereafter. So you know when one door closes, another one opens, right? Um, 
so of course a big a big thing is um, you know preparing for your interviews right I mean I I took it serious I my wife asked me interview questions I googled you know what are what are the top 25 IT or cybersecurity related um, interview questions that you're that you're likely to be asked um, and I prepared for for sort of weird questions or like you know where do you see yourself in five years or or you know d describe yourself or what makes you tick I remember that was a question I was asked and it kind of stumped me because I wasn't ready for that type of question. So, you know, uh, prepare, right? Um, never hurts to be prepared. Uh, it just gives that extra bit of confidence uh, going in that you're, that you're ready for all these questions. And I've, I mean, the interview is make or break, right? It's first impressions. Um, so very, very important, I think, to prepare. Um, and in this landscape, everybody's, you know, there's a lot of people out of work and there's, the competition is really high. So, uh, you know, definitely uh, I highly recommend you know, um, doing some interview preparation before you before you uh, you know apply and, and try to get some of these cybersecurity jobs. Um, so I've only got a four or five slides left, um, but um, we'll just get through these last few. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them in the chat. You know, if not, that's fine. You can reach out to me later if you have anything. Um, so step nine, I think, of twelve is I mean, land the job, right? Uh, for me. Um, I, like I told you, I applied to Ontario, didn't work out, and I applied to a job in New York City, and the recruiter came back and said that they weren't interested, but he knew of an opportunity in Alberta, and that was with ION. So he, uh, he called me, and we spoke for a while, and he was able to understand that unique position I was in where I was an IT person with lots of experience, lots of security experience, which I applied on the job, but I didn't have that piece of paper. You know that let me that that let employers know that I had some sort of baseline of security knowledge. It was all self-taught and you know books online and your home lab and everything like that. So um, you know he he understood my unique position and he uh, he relayed that to the ion. And it's funny I I had a call one day with this guy Steve. I didn't know who who he was. And he worked with, works with ion, and uh, you know I was fine. I wasn't nervous. It was just a you know, kind of basic interview type questions. And then later I found out it was Steve Mathiser who was, who was <laughs> presented at B-Sides before. He's presenting tomorrow, you know, very well respected in the uh, in the security industry. So if I had known it was uh, Steve Mathiser, uh, I would have been a lot more nervous. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's besides the point. Um, and just answering your question, uh, yes, yeah, in the CISSP, um, I don't really feel that's for me. I mean, I'm, I've only been in IT security, cybersecurity for two years. Uh, so I really enjoy, you know, being in the trenches and doing the actual work. Uh, I, I kind of feel like CISSP is such a huge commitment, and it just it's just something that doesn't interest me personally. You know, maybe five years from now, when maybe I'm a little bit tired of the day-to-day -day pen tests and things, uh, maybe that's something that I would, um, you know, something I would think about. Uh, but right now, no, I enjoy, you know, everything's still really new and exciting for me, and I, I learn new things all the time. So CISSP is not something that I would be interested in at this time. But, I mean, you never know. A couple of years down the road, four or five years, it's anything's possible. Um, and so so when, you, when you're doing your interview, you know, you, you want to try to, you want to be confident, but you want to be um, honest and, and sincere. You want to try to make a connection with your interviewer. I mean, it might be a little bit more difficult now that everybody's doing this over Zoom or Teams. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that, that person who's interviewing you has, you know, he'll have an opinion of you and he'll be interviewing multiple people. So you know, if you can make a connection and you can be open and friendly and, and easygoing and try not to be too nervous, you know, have a little bit of fun with it, um, I think that will go a long way, you know, in, in sort of standing out. Uh, and for me, I was told, um, you know, I could have hired people who had a lot more experience than I did. So I only had, I had my GPEN certification and my self-taught experience, and that was it. Um, but I was told that my name kept coming up just because of my enthusiasm and because of, for whatever reason, uh, you know, that's what the interviewer mentioned to me that uh, my name just kept popping up over and over. So I felt like maybe, maybe there's there's something to that. So thankfully, you know, they did take a chance on me and they hired me. But you know, I, I think if I had done poorly in the interview and if I wasn't prepared, I probably wouldn't have landed the job in the first place. Uh, just because there's lots of competition out there, and, and I'm sure there was lots of applicants with three or five or, or ten years' um, experience. So, you know, I was lucky, but uh, again, prepare prepare for those interviews and those interview questions. And, you know, have, have a little bit of fun with it. I mean, I'm, 
a bit nervous. I haven't done anything like this before. This is my first ever um, conference or speaking engagement. But you know, it is at the end of the day something that I'm comfortable talking about. So you know, I, have, I try to have a little bit of fun with it with the uh, with the slides earlier on about the cracked windshields and the uh, and the wind and the snow. Um, so I've only I've got four slides left, and then there's a couple of questions there uh, I'll get to also. So for me, the last step, you know, I, I made a plan, I studied, I, I passed my certification, I applied for jobs, I, I landed a really good job in Alberta. So now, I mean, I had to uproot my whole life, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm, I was living in Newfoundland, it's just my wife and I, no kids. So I had to tell my family that we're leaving. Uh, we had a house, so we had to, we rented the bottom. Uh, we lived in the top, so we had to find a tenant and live in the top. Um, we sold everything, uh, sectional, we sold our car at a hot tub on a deck, we sold that. Uh, we had to send our dogs on different days because we couldn't send our dogs together because of the breed specific legislation and the time of year and uh, the size of the aircraft, I think there was some restrictions there. So we had to send one dog uh, one day and one the other. So that was really stressful. Uh, and funny story, actually, we had a girl stay at our house um, and she was to send the dogs to the airport. And she messaged us in the morning and she said, oh my God, I slept in. So she missed the flight. So we were freaking out and just added more stress, right? But uh, eventually we got the dogs here. So that was nice. And we were worried because some people said uh, if they're in Ontario, they could be seized by the government or the police or whomever uh, because of their breed. So that was a really, really stressful thing for us. But thankfully they, uh, they landed in Ontario and they uh, they were stored there for several hours, and then eventually we were able to. Uh, they sent them off uh, from Ontario to uh, to Calgary, so that was really nice to get the dogs off the off the plane and in, and in our hands. Um, so then, of course, we had all kinds all kinds of other logistics. We had to rent a house. Um, we had to rent a house on scene, right? We rented it uh, from Newfoundland. This, uh, this old drafty house from the 1980s, <laughs> but it was good enough. Uh, and, and it was tough to find a place that accepted pets, especially the pit bull type breeds. So that was really stressful. Uh, and once we landed on the 24th of November, we had to uh, rent a vehicle, we had to get a sectional, we had to get a TV, a bed. So, so there was no rest, right? It was very, very stressful. And it was about 30 days, it was a whirlwind type thing. Uh, but you know, we, we did it, right? And that's when I talk about take the shot and don't be scared, don't be afraid. So that's what we did. Um, you know, on the first day, like I said, we bought all the necessities. And the second day we went out and bought, uh, you know, towels and garbage buckets and, and cutlery and just lamps and, you know, everything, everything you, you had to start over from scratch, right? So that was, that was very interesting. Um, so, you know, we operated our whole life, but, you know, life is short. And I feel I'm, I'm really, really happy that, I, that we did it. And I really would have regretted it if I'd looked back and said, you know, oh, that's too much effort. And, it's too much work and we wouldn't be able to do it in 30 days, but we, you know, we did it and it's worked out really well so far. Um, so funny story, the, the first day I landed in Calgary, as I mentioned, was the 24th. And uh, so it was a Saturday and uh, on the 26th was my first day. So the wife had a brilliant idea of let's rent a Wrangler. Um, so I've never driven one before. We always liked them. So we rented a Wrangler, this big, huge vehicle that I was not used to driving. And then Monday morning, I'm driving down in a new area I've never been before and five lanes of traffic, which, which we don't have in Newfoundland, we only have, only have two. And you know, Deerfoot, 7.30 a.m., Monday morning traffic, GPS is telling me where to go. I've got this big, huge vehicle. I'm frightened to death that I'm gonna scratch it up or get in a car accident. Um, Anyway, so that was really, really stressful. So I managed to make it to the underground parking and the, the parking app put me in the compact stall that I didn't know at the time. So I was freaking out. So they, I go to my stall number and I'm reversing the Wrangler and I hear this big scrape and scratchy noise. So I stop and I get out and there's a sprinkler system in the underground parking that I scraped. So in the little spot, I don't know if you can see it, uh, this little spot here, whoops, sorry. Um, this little spot here, uh, I had it, <laughs> it was all scraped up and I scraped all the black off. So before I returned the uh, the vehicle, I just grabbed a black Sharpie and I colored in the little, you know, it was probably that big. I colored, it, colored in the scraped off area because it was white and uh, returned the vehicle and the, the guy who uh, who looked it over didn't notice it. So uh, <laughs> it's probably, probably saved me a few dollars there, but I just thought it was funny that, you know, driving this big vehicle and of course, 
day one, I pull into the parking stall and I damage the vehicle, right? So, uh, you know, it's just, just kind of funny, I suppose. Uh, but he didn't catch it, so good, on, it's good for me. Um, so, you know, just, just to summarize, um, you know, if, if you want to transition from IT to cybersecurity, which most of you guys are probably already in it, um, for me, I had to, I gained IT experience first. And of course, as you gain IT experience, you're exposed to, you know, the, the nature of the beast, right? You're exposed to passwords and active directory. You're exposed to account lockouts and, and securing devices and servers. And you're exposed to, you know, all these different um, aspects of cybersecurity that you just kind of pick up on your day-to-day -day work, right? Uh, endpoint detections and antivirus and patching and all these different uh, things that, that are very important in the work that we do. So you, you gain that experience even just secondhand, just from putting out fires day to day, right? If you're on the help desk, for example. Um, so I really think that it would be very, very difficult if you were just fresh out of school and didn't really have any IT experience and thought, I wanna work in cybersecurity. So I think it's a better idea and a more logical way to go about it is to gain that experience first, you know, help desk, um, a SOC analyst, you know, help with your mom and dad, your coworkers, anything to get you that experience. Um, and then, of course, once you get that experience, you, that might lead you into um, your passion, right? For me, it was Linux security. That was my big start. Uh, I always, I didn't know it on the time, like I didn't know about red teams, blue teams, but I was really interested in the, um, the blue side, the defensive side, Linux security and hardening servers and systems and modifying kernels and locking down servers and services. So that was where I really, really started. And, and now my work with Ion is more on the offensive side. Um, but that's, you know, you have to discover that passion, right? Maybe it's incident response or forensics or, or web application security, whatever it is. So once you know, uh, that's right, yeah, TJ. Yeah, Linux all the way, right? Uh, and, and of course, back in the day, and still is Linux is the hacker's operating system of choice. Uh, although I will say that I use, I probably use Windows about the same, maybe even a little bit more um, than Linux, just because if I can avoid switching from one operating system to the other, I'll just, I'll just do that. But when I was younger, I was a real Linux snob and I hated Microsoft and I hated Bill Gates and all that stuff. So I've softened over the years as I've, uh, as I've matured. And now I have a healthy respect for, for both Windows, Linux and, and Mac, uh, for example. Uh, so of course, you know, create that plan, right? Uh, if you fail the plan, you plan to fail. So, you know, I had it up on the board. I'm gonna study this book and then I'm gonna study this book and I'm gonna have my certification uh, exam, practice exam on this date, and then I'm going to take my exam on this date, and then I'm going to take the next month or two after that to, to look for jobs and network and update my resume and all that kind of thing. So, you know, create that plan, uh, save your money, right? I mean, certifications can be costly. Uh, you know, Security Plus and CEH and some of those other ones, they're about a thousand bucks, right? So if you can save $25 a week for a year, uh, there you go. There's your thousand dollars or more. Um, and of course, you know, we talked about there's other ways. There's savings apps. I mean, maybe there's a, maybe you get an income tax refund, put away a couple hundred bucks uh, to that, you know, for your certification. Uh, so if you really want it, you know, you'll, you'll find the money somewhere. You know, write your exam, study hard, you know, pass your exam, uh, get out there and network, update your resume, uh, start and start applying for work, right? I mean, um, if, if you can, if you have the flexibility that I do, or I did, and that I don't have children, I don't have kids in school and all that, we could, we could have, we easily uh, no, I wouldn't say easily, but we moved um, quickly, right? And we did it in about 30 days. Uh, that's probably not the, the norm, but um, I think, you know, if you can do it, apply for everything. Who knows? Maybe maybe the job you apply for, um, you're, not, you're not qualified for, but maybe there's another position in that same company, or maybe the recruiter knows another position, another opportunity, which is, which is what happened in my case. I applied for a job in New York and uh, didn't work out, but the recruiter knew of the position in, in Alberta. So that's how it happened for me. But apply for everything. There's no harm in applying. And worst case scenario, you get good uh, interview experience and exposure. And a lot of these companies will keep your resume on file. And sometimes they'll reach out if something comes up, you know, down the line. And, you know, the last last thing, I guess, what I've been talking about is, is take the shot if you can. You know, don't be scared. I mean, I was nervous and afraid and sleepless nights and, you know, many, um, many days I went home you know, after uh, a tough day and, and thinking, you know, I don't think I can do this. And I didn't have much confidence, but, uh, you know, everything works out and you gain little bits of confidence here and there and you gain more knowledge and more experience. So everything gets better uh, the more you do it. So, you know, don't be afraid to take the shot if you can. Um, what's the worst case scenario? You move, 
it doesn't work out and you go back home and start again. So, you know, I, I do realize I was lucky that I didn't have to take kids out of school or anything like that. Uh, no, it was still difficult, you know, moving the dogs and everything and, and just having to sell everything and move and start over in a new job, a new, new province and everything. But, uh, you know, it worked out. It worked out well for me. Um, so uh, that's pretty much it. There's a couple of questions. Um, I think there was one about... Oh, I've got one more slide, by the way. Um, I don't see it here now. Or CP. Uh, what are some good websites for beginners to practice VA and PT? Um, I haven't spent a whole lot of time, but but someone mentioned Hack the Box is good. Try Hack Me is really good. Um, Burp has a web application online a sort of school that you can use, so that's really really good. I mean, there's tons of free courses out there, free material, YouTube training videos, I mean, you name it, it's all out there. You don't really have to pay for anything. But I think, yeah, Hack the Box is good, Try Hack Me, uh, Vone Hub is another good one. Those are really, really nice. The only problem with those I find sometimes is um, they don't necessarily reflect the real world as much as I would have liked. Like for me, when I took the pen testing course, I thought I was ready. And then once I actually started working on a client site, I knew that I wasn't ready because there's just some areas where you can't, you know, a, a pen testing course is not going to prepare you for everything. Uh, so there was a lot of areas where, you know, I, I didn't have any exposure. So you just kind of, you know, you learn on the fly and you pick it up as you go. Um, so I don't know if there's any other questions there. I uh, just have one. Yeah, Portswigger Web Academy is really, really good. Um, and just one other slide. Um, I, I told my dad um, back in April, I think when I was selected for B-Sides, you know, he was really excited and, uh, you know, he, he didn't get to come up to Alberta. And he was back in Newfoundland and he was really excited and proud. Uh, but unfortunately, he passed away uh, two months ago. So he didn't get to see this talk. So I just wanted to dedicate it to him. Um, you know, he was really, really proud and he was excited. And he was happy that, that the move is working out well for us. It's this, this November, end of November, it'll be two years. And, you know, we're, we're doing well and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and really glad I did the move. But I just want to dedicate that, uh, that to my dad. So, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I don't think there's any questions. Uh, if there are, put them in the chat. If not, uh, my email address is there. You can reach out. Uh, my LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, LinkedIn is in my profile. And um, you can just search for my name or Ion United. But it, in, in the participants for this, for B-Sides in my profile, I, I did put it in there. So, um, you know, feel free to add me anytime. Uh, I'm, I'm still new to cybersecurity. I've only been doing this for two years. Uh, I lean on my coworkers all the time, Chris and Chris Simmons, Steve Mathiser, and everybody else at ION. Been a huge help in helping me grow and, and develop. So I would more than be willing to provide any guidance or, or um, recommendations for anybody else who is looking to get into that industry. Um, but, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. I don't know how long actually I was supposed to talk. Uh, but I think it's probably been about 50 or 55 minutes. So um, if there are no other questions, take care and uh, have a good day. See ya. Bye-bye.